Thanks, thanks. <laughs> all right. Well, it's, um, it's a, great, a great privilege to be with you. I love being with you guys all the time anyway. And uh, to be able to talk to you about uh, one of the most important subjects in my life over the last, well, probably my, my whole life in ministry is the renewed mind. And uh, the Lord has really targeted it uh, quite strongly in the last 10, 12 years, maybe 14 years. And it, 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 started, it started when I began to realize that the responsibility of a believer is to demonstrate, illustrate, prove the will of God. And the will of God, according to Scripture, is thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So just think about that with me for a minute. The renewed, renewed mind has the responsibility and privilege, two sides of the same coin, responsibility and privilege to demonstrate, to illustrate, to prove God's will, which is on earth as it is in heaven. I am fascinated by the Gospels. I'm fascinated by how Jesus lived. I'm, I'm stunned by how he thought. I, I realize that we're, I, that we're just so, so different on, on how we approach stuff. You know, he, he approached a crowd with very little food, and there was no paralyzing moment in him where he thought, oh, no, what are we going to do? Uh, this is going to require a big one. You don't ever see that because he just thought differently. And he's working to change our perspective on reality. And for every person in this room, your beginning with Christ started with repentance. That's where we started. As he called your name, he spoke to you, you came alive, and you, you turned. And the word repentance uh, is often uh, illustrated or demonstrated by sometimes weeping at an altar, confessing sin. All those are parts and very legitimate expressions uh, that are consistent with the word repentance. But technically what the word means is it's a changing of the way you think. It's a sorrow over sin that produces a shift in perspective. That's what it comes down to. A sorrow over sin that produces a shift in how you and I see reality is that we actually see things from God's perspective. So think with me for a minute. We start in this life with Christ. We turn from sin. Our faith is in God. There is this shift that takes place, and it starts with repentance, a change in our view on sin and life. And in that change, the life of a disciple is walking in repentance. The only other time I need to repent is when I've not continued to walk in an honoring way to the Lord. When I shift back to old ways of thinking, old ways of living, then the Lord says once again, as he did through the book of Revelation, it's time to repent. You have to turn back to God's perspective on reality. And what the Lord is looking for is he's looking for not just individuals. I'm thankful when I look through history, you know, when you see folks like uh, Smith Wigglesworth or, you know, some of the giants of faith, or Charles Finney, or some of these people that just lived and they just seem to think so differently than, than the average person around them. I'm thankful for these heroes, but I, I, I sincerely believe that the Lord is looking to raise up a generation that carry, I don't know if global mindset is right, but carry a, this, this mantle on the mind of Christ that changes literally how we do life. How we do life, how we, how we, our conversation, our values, everything, the way we view conflict or problems, the way we react to international crisis or personal problems, whatever it might be, everything shifts when we learn to live in that mode of repentance, of changing how we think. So, um, when I look at, because I'm so fascinated by miracles and uh, without apology, just the, the mandate that is on the life of every believer to do as Jesus did. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I send you. So we have, this, we have this mandate, we have this responsibility. So because of this issue of miracles, this is what I get fascinated with. I see in history, I see people that through extraordinary faith were able to demonstrate the miraculous. I watch... Um, I've been, in, I've been in atmospheres where the presence of God was so powerful, so thick, that you, you actually didn't need to pray for people. They got healed sometimes by calling out their condition. I've had people just simply stand up and a miracle would hit them. I would have them. I've, I've been in moments where the presence and power of God is so strong that if somebody just stands in a, 
in a certain part of the room, everyone who stands there over a certain period of time, everyone who stands there is just healed. Nobody prays for them. Nobody does anything. All right, so there's healing then, miracles through faith. There's miracles through the anointing, through the presence. This one is through the renewed mind. And you know your mind's renewed when the impossible looks logical. It's this shift where suddenly what used to intimidate and bring fear now actually excites. It actually stirs up because now there's a target for why we're alive. There's, a, there's something to address and to live for, to see this situation reversed for the glory of God, to see a situation reversed so that, so that people get to experience heaven on earth. Get, they get to experience the tangible presence of God and his, and his mandate on us to demonstrate the kingdom. So why don't you grab your Bibles and... Uh, we're going to uh, start with Romans chapter 12, which is the uh, core passage on the renewed mind. So let's, um, let's see how much damage we can do in just a <laughs> very, very short period of time. Romans chapter 12, and verse 2 is the great, great passage that uh, probably most of you could quote without looking at it, but I do want you to see it in your own Bible. So <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. 12. We'll start with verse 1, but verse 2 is where, uh, where we want to land. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Present, <laughs> present your body as an offering. It's the intellectual thing to do. You know, uh, the Lord is, is demanding some things of us on the emphasis of the mind because many of the circles that some of us anyway are from, our historical backgrounds in church, they de-emphasize the intellect, de-emphasize the mind. And Jesus never did that. He didn't want the intellect to be outside of his influence and then have that intellect in charge because that's called the carnal Christian. But he does want the renewed mind to have tremendous influence because the renewed mind, faith doesn't come from the mind. It comes from the heart. With the heart, man believes. So faith doesn't come from the mind. It comes from the heart. But the renewed mind enhances faith. It fuels it. It gives it parameters to function in. It's like banks of a river. So the renewed mind actually, uh, it's, it's almost like... Um, Enabling something to flow in a specific direction. Does that make sense? Yes? Good. All right, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Read it again. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is such a huge subject for us. I almost feel a little bit intimidated trying to tackle this well in the, in the time that we have left. But I want you to see something. Do you remember the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus is standing on the mountain and a couple of the guys are there with him and they look at him and his, it says his clothing is white as no launderer can whiten him. Luke's gospel says... It was glistening. And the word glistening there is the word for like lightning flashes. That's a fairly impressive image. To have somebody standing there and having their clothing be lightning. All right. That was what? Mount of transfiguration. That word transfiguration is the basic same word as the renewed transformed mind. So Jesus on the mountain transfigured before them is a physical representation of what the renewed mind looks like. It is legitimately brilliant. No pun intended, but it does work. All right? So here we have it. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Those aren't three levels of the will of God. I've heard that taught before, and it's silly. You know, I want to do the perfect will of God. My friend wants to do the acceptable will. No, it's three words that describe the same thing. 
Amen, Bill. <laughs> I'll just let you walk that one out. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Thoughts empower the invisible. Thoughts empower the unseen world. The big warning in Scripture is the the Corinthian passage that talks about um, taking thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And those thoughts are strongholds that the enemy operates out of. The thought life of a person either enhances faith or undermines faith. And I understand that we have the mind of Christ. That's been given to us. It is our possession. It is our inheritance. But how many of you understand there's a difference between what's in my possession and what's in my account? I can live with full legal access to the mind of Christ regarding any issue in life, but it doesn't mean I'm necessarily operating in it. I have access to it. What's important for us is to learn to, through repentance to shift into the mind of Christ. All right, back to this passage. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove the will of God. My favorite way to illustrate this is through um, just saying that a person is able to put evidence out. He's able to say, right, here's the will of God, heaven on earth. This is, this is what it looks like when the will of God hits cancer. Cancer dissolves. This is what it looks like when... The will of God hits uh, a person who's addicted to alcohol or drugs or whatever it might be. They get free. So the will of God comes and manifests, and it changes that situation. It's heaven on earth. Never lose sight of the standard for God's will on earth, and the renewed mind illustrates and models it. But this word prove actually is a whole lot bigger than to model or demonstrate. It actually means to approve. To approve. It means to thoroughly examine until you've come to the absolute conclusion that this is legitimate. So think with me a minute. Let's let's pretend I'm um, I'm a a Van Gogh specialist. A Van Gogh painting was uh, recently discovered that they thought was lost forever. And uh, if you can imagine, and you know anything about Van Gogh paintings, you you find one of those in your attic. you know, you can quit whatever job you have because you'll be doing quite fine the rest of your life. So here, here's, here's paintings that are worth tens of millions of dollars, and somebody actually found one in their uh, estate. And uh, so let's say that you, in, you have an inheritance, you have an estate, and you're going through the paintings that are in the, you know, what, attic or whatever, and you find one, and there's a signature on the bottom. And let's say because this is my story, I'm the expert on Van Gogh. And you need to have this verified, validate this legitimate. Because if it's legitimate, it's worth tens of millions. If it's a copy, it's worth tens. <laughs> Slight difference. And so you want somebody who is an expert to actually validate what, what you have. And so you bring it to me, and I, I take whatever steps are necessary in examining the canvas, the paint, the brush strokes. I've studied every single brush stroke of Van Gogh for my entire life. I know his style. I know his use of color. I know uh, the canvas, the age of the canvas. So I, I, I run all these tests on everything, and I call you after two or three weeks of testing, and I say, hey, you may want to sit down for this, but I've got incredibly good news. Um, you, you have a, an authentic Van Gogh painting. What happened? I, I did this. I approved. I proved that you had an original. Let's say that you have a friend who calls you, real good friends. In fact, we're going to give you dreams from two friends, both of them really solid, good people. The first one calls you and he says, um, I had this dream about you last night, and I feel like the Lord wanted me to tell you that you're going to go through a season where you have horrible disease in your body, but God's going to use it to build great character in you, and he's going to use this disease to bring your family members together and bring healing to to your your whole family line. And you hang up the phone, depressed, of course, (laughs) with another illustration of the gospel of good news. And... uh, and two or three days later, another person calls you and says, hey, I, was, uh, I, I, I had this dream and the Lord spoke to me. I felt like I was supposed to tell you that the Lord is releasing uh, a new measure of anointing on your life where you're going to see the most impossible situations uh, you've ever faced or heard of in your life. Everybody around you, they're going to come to you because this anointing, you're going to see breakthrough at a level you've never seen before. What do you have? You just were given in the same week two paintings. 
And the renewed mind takes a look at these paintings and then goes to the originals. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you look at every brushstroke. You look at every word that he had towards an afflicted or tormented person. You look at the result, the end product, the, the finished work, the finished painting of everything that he ever accomplished. And then you compare these two paintings that you were just given. And you look at them and you compare them to the originals. And you're able, through a renewed mind, to come to the conclusion one is authentic, one was a nice try. (laughs) What the Lord is looking for out of your life and mine is to live having been impacted by the originals. I, I love the epistle. I like the whole Bible. I mean, I, I, I like the table of contents. You know, I like the maps. I, I, I believe all of it. I believe my leather cover. T- I just believe all of it. I like all of it. I even my coffee stains on here, I even believe in. You know? But there's something about the authentic works of Christ that we see in the four Gospels, and in the book of Acts. I'm not saying the rest isn't important. I'm just saying, learn to identify the originals. Learn to recognize his tone of voice towards people. How did he operate when he saw a problem? What did he do when he was surprised by a need? Don't think he knew in advance always what was happening. He was caught off guard. He would say, man, I haven't seen such faith like this in all of Israel. He he would be stunned. He'd be so moved by faith. We know that Jesus only did what he saw his father do, but sometimes that word, I don't believe, came directly to him. Sometimes the Holy Spirit would show him what the father was doing, and he, of course, would do that. But there are times where the Syrophoenician woman comes to him and and, uh, needs a miracle for his daughter, and he's already been instructed by the father that we're not ministering to the Gentiles yet. And so he says, I can't give the children's bread to dogs. And then she begins to operate at an extraordinary level of faith. Where does she get that faith? She can only get it from the father. How does he know what the father's doing? He sees it in her eyes. He sees it, oh, The only way that could be there is that the work of grace from my father is operating in her. And he shifted his focus and he ministered to her. It's learning to recognize that faith. That's how we learn to see what the father is doing. Sometimes that faith we recognize in our own heart. I don't ever stop to evaluate it. (laughs) I don't know if it works this way for you, but it's kind of like opening a jar and whatever was in there, as soon as I look at it, it evaporates. So I don't ever analyze my faith. I act on it. I operate on what I sense God doing. At the end, I can look back and say, all right, that was a gift of faith. But in the moment, I can't become preoccupied with me, the gift, the calling, anything. I have to just do what I sense and feel the heart of the Father. I believe that that, in a sense, is an illustration of the renewed mind. The renewed mind that you and I have been called to learn to live in. Learn to live in every day of our life. The renewed mind starts by, how do you think about him? What is he like? See, this studying, if you will, of the original paintings, it really really reveals the father, the father, the father's heart towards blind Bartimaeus. What dad in this room wouldn't heal their blind son if you had the ability to? I mean, every one of us as moms, as dads, would do anything we could do for our children Jesus came to reveal the Father. Jesus came to illustrate that. So when you see Jesus touching blind Bartimaeus, you see him, you see him um, showing great compassion to the woman caught in adultery. You see these moments, every one of these moments is Jesus, the Son of God, illustrating the Father to a person. And everybody in this room, that's our mandate, that's our call, that's our privilege, is to realize that we have a perfect Perfect, wonderful, loving Father. I think part of the heart and soul of this shift and transformation in how we do life, how we think, is that we we change our understanding of what he's like. You know, I I, I tell you all the time, so I hope it doesn't get too old, but, you know, he's just better than we think, so we have to change the way we think. We have to actually shift 
how we think about him, his reactions to problems, to conflicts. You know, he doesn't wring his hands over stuff. He doesn't pace the halls of heaven wondering, man, how am I going to fix that ozone layer problem? You know, I mean, it just, it, 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 this stuff doesn't mess him up. It doesn't mess him up when he sees, you know, a crisis hit nations as, as, as grieving as it may be. Um, he has answers to every single problem. And you and I, through the renewed mind, come into a place of confidence where we say, you know what, I, I believe that God not only has answers, but he has them available for me. And I'm, I'm going to pursue them. I'm going to grab hold of what the Lord says is available to us. And so here's what I want to do as we start this uh, class, this curriculum, as we start this uh, period of time together. I, I want to pray that there would actually be a grace, an impartation, something that would be released in the time that we have together where you find yourself thinking different about stuff. Your exposure to God's hand, his voice, his face. All those things are unveiled to every one of us in different measure, but they're all unveiled to shift how we operate, how we think, how we react, how we respond. All of that is to build in us a history with God that knows this is his nature. This is what he's like. Somebody could go to my wife and say, oh, your husband said such and such, and if it was a if it was a horrible thing or a bad thing, she, she knows me so well, she would be able to look at them and say, no, it's not possible for him to say that. He doesn't have that in him. It's, it's, not, it's not true. Because she knows how I think. She knows how I, how I react, how I respond to stuff. You and I represent him. And we have this incredible privilege to respond as Jesus responds to situations. So here's what we're going to do. I'm, we're going to pray that throughout these uh, sessions that we have together, I want to pray that every single session releases another layer, another layer of impartation, that it would literally take us weeks and perhaps even months to unveil what God would release into our lives, into our hearts through this time that we have together. So put your hand on your heart. I want to pray for you. And uh, Father, I, I ask right now that you would release that grace, that that divine enablement to think and to see and to perceive like you do. We don't want to just have good religious attempts. We actually want to see through your eyes. I would pray for everybody in this room that somehow our heart would even begin to beat like yours in a, in a new way, a new level, that our, your heartbeat would, would be our heartbeat. We would, we would sense what you have compassion for. We would set, sense what you... Uh, get enthused over and excited for. And I, I just pray that as a company of people and as individuals that we would learn to discern, to pick up your heart. I pray for this grace to be released as a gift.